Hi. Earlier this week, I was invited by Dorothea Reed from the Clinical Hypnotherapy School to talk with a group, in essence, about how Chris, Harvey, and I became brief. And the talk, actually it was quite long, but the talk seemed to interest people. And so I thought I would record for others a shorter version of that story. So here we are, Chris, Harvey and me, uh, 30 or so years ago. And in 1987, we came across the work of Steve DeShazer. And it's fair to say that the three of us um, fell in love with the ideas, fell in love with the approach. And we worked incredibly hard on trying to learn to use Steve's ideas that on the one hand seemed terribly simple, and on the other hand were quite demanding to practice. And, uh, and so in 1990, we invited Steve to London and he delivered a workshop for two days and 260 other people thought it would be interesting and attended. And he worked with us for one day, supervising our work and leading live sessions uh, during the, a clinical day together. And in fact, in Zuckerberg came as well. And so on that first occasion in 1990, we met both Steve and Insu. And when we first came across Steve's ideas, the shape they took in essence was this. And some of you may have read this paper. It was the seminal introduction to Solution Focus. It was the um, announcement of a new approach. And the way the model was structured in those days was first element of the approach, was an introduction to the setup and to the procedures. So clients were explained or explained to them how the session was going to work. And then, and this would be a very, very unusual uh, uh, way to start a session now, so then Steve or Insu would ask the question, what brings you here? They would invite a statement of complaint. Now, obviously, we wouldn't do that now, but that's how they started. And following the statement of complaint, they would move into exploring exceptions, exceptions to the rule of the domination of the complaint. So times when the complaint could have happened, but didn't, or happened less, or happened with less intensity, or lasted less long. So that was the third phase of the session. And uh, the fourth phase of the session was establishing goals for therapy. And what Steve said about that was you were establishing goals in order to figure out which of the exceptions might be, and the word he used was salient, might be significant, might be useful in that way. And having established goals for therapy, what they then went on to do was to describe a better future, very often using the miracle question. And Steve's idea about this was when you were describing the miracle question, or when you're inviting the client to describe the miracle question, what you were doing was defining potential solutions. The Milwaukee team would always at that point take a break, consult their colleagues, and when they came back into the room, they would deliver a message and the message would include first of all a set of compliments the things that the worker in the room 
had been impressed by. And the point of the compliments was to create what they referred to in those days, drawing for the work of Milton Erickson, to create a yes set. So the client would be induced into a yes, I agree with that. Yes, I agree with that. Yes, I agree with that. And then, of course, they would offer a bridging statement which connected the compliments and the logic of the task that was offered. And the task was absolutely central. The whole of the session, if you like, was moving towards the task. And Stephen Insu's idea in those days was that change happened predominantly outside of the session as a result of people doing the task. That's how change would happen. So the task was very central. You could see the talking and the thinking moving towards the task at the end of the session. So that was the model that in 1987, when Chris Harvey and I came across this approach, we were trying to learn, trying to teach ourselves to learn in those days. Now, 33 or 34 years later, an awful lot has changed. You can see that just by looking at us. A lot has changed. But not just, you know, it's not just the way that Chris Harvey and I look has changed, but in addition, during the course of those years, something has happened. And what I think has happened is that we've shifted from three people, fascinated, passionate, in love with a set of ideas and trying to learn how to do them, trying to become, if you like, mini Steve DeShazers, to becoming brief. Over those years, we've somehow become brief. And as we've become brief, actually our thinking about the model has changed. So what have we got now? If you compare the Milwaukee model of 1986 to the brief model of the year 2000, what's the difference? So what we've got now, I think, is rather than starting with what brings you here, we start with best hopes. So what are your best hopes from our talking together? How could you know that our talking together had been of use to you? And following the best hopes, we invite people in a really extended descriptive sequence to describe the life that contains the best hopes. That's the preferred future. The life that contains the best hopes. And from the relatively short, broad brush description that Steve elicited in his miracle question all those years ago, this description of the preferred future can take 35 to 40 minutes, perhaps, a really extended, detailed description. And following that, oh, and the description, look, three aspects of it. It's a three-dimensional picture. We're inviting people to offer their own perspective. How will you know that your best hopes are happening? Who are the key significant people in your life and how will they notice that the best hopes are happening? And then stepping into a making it come alive, an interactive picture, an interactional picture. So when your partner notices you getting up earlier, will he or she be pleased? Will they be pleased? Yeah. How will you know that he, she, or they are pleased to notice you get up earlier? Because they'll say, do you want a cup of tea? And would you be pleased to hear your partner saying, do you want a cup of tea? Yeah. So how would your partner 
know that you are pleased because I'd smile and say, thank you. Yeah, I'd love a cup of tea. So we invite people to start describing interactional sequences. So the client's perspective, the perspective of others, and then meshing those perspectives together into an interactional sequence. So best hopes, preferred future. And then look, I would invite people into a scale question, a best hope scale. 10, all of your best hopes are all happening. Nought's the furthest much you've ever been. Where would you see yourself now? So we're inviting the client to describe what they're doing that's working. And then very likely we'll invite the client to start describing one point up. Imagine you found yourself. Listen to those words, found yourself. Imagine you found yourself just one point up on your scale. How could you know? Again, listen to the language, very tentative. Moving away from the, the wills, how will you know, to something much softer. How could you know? I'll often add, maybe, perhaps. And then following that, and again, I would describe this as optional now, and I'll come back and explain why I would say it's optional. I would move into an ending sequence. And my ending sequence fundamentally is made up of anything else. Is there anything else you had in mind to say that I've not given you the opportunity to say? Mostly people say no. I would then suggest to people, look, or offer people the idea, so what have you heard yourself saying during the course of our talking today that could end up being useful to you that might be worth remembering and taking back into your life with you? Therapy somehow isn't life. So what did you hear yourself saying that might be worth remembering and taking back into your life? And people very often tell you some things they heard themselves saying. Remember, it's not what you heard me saying, it's what you heard yourself saying. I might then add some other things. And look, I was also really interested to hear you say this and to hear you say that. Very often, little instances of the preferred future that the client has described. And then, I don't know how to describe this. I end the session with some helpful information to the client. No tasks, no homework, not even a suggestion anymore. Just if you like a benevolent warning. Look, if you do decide to come back, if that could be useful to you, let me warn you now. The very first question I'll ask you is what's been better? So if you start watching out for that now, it might make your next session easier for you. I'm not telling the client what they have to do. I'm not even suggesting what they should do. I'm just helpfully telling them that if they want the next session to be easier, they could start watching out for what's been better. But that's their business. It's not my business. It's their business, what they do between sessions. And they might do it or they might not. That's up to them. And then people come back and we ask what's been better. And based on their account of what's been better, what we're doing is asking questions which invite them to amplify, to grow that picture of what's been better and its significance. Now I say optional um, in relation to the scale because um, our friend and colleague, Elliot Connie, uh, would very rarely ask a scale question. He just best hopes preferred future during a first session. And uh, although my colleague, uh, who worked for many years, of course, uh, probably would use a scale, neither Chris nor Elliot would actually step into the ending sequence. Both would tend to stop just by saying, I've run out of questions. I think we're done. 
So what you can see is you've, we've moved to something much, much more minimal, if you like. And what I'm interested in is what is it that's driven that shift? How have we got from the 1986 version of De Chaser, if you like, to the brief 2020 version of Solution Focus? And the way that I would see it is that what we've done is to try to take one particular aspect of Steve DeShazer's thinking seriously, teaching seriously. And what I think we've done is to take seriously, or to take more seriously, what Steve said and what he wrote more seriously than what Steve actually did. Because if we think about what Steve said and what he wrote, then I think there's two key themes that we would draw out of that. And the third, first was his constant interest in minimalism. There was a test of necessity. If something you do in therapy is not necessary, and necessary, I guess, is defined as associated with good outcome, then it's redundant and actually impositional. It's redundant and impositional. So the only way we can justify doing something in therapy is through the answer to the question, is it necessary? And if it's necessary, then yeah, it's justified. But if it's not necessary, then how would we justify that action, if you like? So there's a test of necessity. And um, of course, Deshazer talked about Occam's razor. And um, William of Occam, the early English philosopher, who wrote, not quite in these words, but people often paraphrase his thinking in these words, what can be done with fewer means is done in vain with more. So there we are, minimalism. But what else? Steve was always interested in simplicity, in reducing complexity. How can we make what we do more and more simple in that way? And there's one thing, I think, an influence that influenced us at Brief in moving from Steve's 1986 version to our 2020, having become Brief version of Solution Focus. And we've taken this from Insu Kim Burke. And that's the idea of invisibility, leaving no footprints. Of course, you can't really leave no footprints. As soon as we meet someone, we've left footprints. But how can we make our presence more and more marginal in the conversation? We can't disappear from it altogether. We're constructing, co-constructing a conversation together. I'm making choices about which of the client's words I'm picking up and working with but how can I actually nonetheless make myself as marginal as is possible? Leave footprints that are as, if you like, shallow as possible, become as invisible as possible in the client's process, change process. So minimal, min, minimalism, pardon me, simplicity and invisibility the three ideas that have driven us. And if we draw you know, quotations from Steve, all of this fits with what Steve was writing over the years. If we go all the way back to 1987, in a paper that he wrote that was called Minimal Elegance, Steve wrote, and here it is, if you want to get from point A to point B, but know no details of the terrain in between, the best thing to do is to assume that you can go from A to B by following a straight line. If this assumption proves faulty and you run into huge mountains, 
then you need to look for a pass that is as close as possible to your straight line. Steve liked that, and he used the same idea again in his third book, third book, Clues. And what I think that one of the things I think that Brief has been doing over all of these years is following that idea, straightening the line. That's what we're trying to do, straighten the line. And oddly, when Steve first developed these ideas, there seemed to us to be some large detours on the road from A to B. You know, if you want to build new possibilities in people's lives, why would you loop back through the problem? Why would you ask people what brings you here? That's a detour that's unnecessary and therefore unjustifiable. And so what we've been doing, standing, if you like, on Steve and Insu and Eve Lipchick's shoulders, the shoulders of true giants, is trying to straighten the line a little, building on their ideas. And look, this is from 1990, a teaching tape of uh, Steve DeShazer again, um, that was made by the American Association for Marital and Family Therapy. And in this, Steve writes, so I went off, he's talking about his history. So I went off to learn how to do therapy magic, a la Ericsson. And I've come 180 degrees on that. The therapist doesn't have the magic. The client has the magic. And we'd better do something small and let the magic operate. And that again, look, that's what we've been trying to do. For example, in getting rid of tasks or homework, we're doing something small and letting the client's magic operate. We're minimalizing, marginalizing the worker's position and centralizing the client's magic. So look, if we summarize those changes, what have we got? The first thing is we're straightening the line. I've been saying that, we've been straightening the line. And we've been moving away from an exception-based model, the Steve's idea that every, there's always exceptions to the rule of every problem. Exceptions, of course, are times when the problem does not happen. But in order to find out about exceptions, times the problem doesn't happen, you have to figure out, you have to ask about problems. How can you know about an exception exception to the rule of the problem unless you know about the, something about the problem. So the idea of exceptions took us through the problem. So Chris Harvey and I let go of the idea of exceptions and developed a model that was preferred future focused. And building on the preferred future, we were interested not in exceptions, times that the problem didn't happen, but instances little bits of the preferred future that were happening. Again, we're straightening the line. Prefer, best hopes, preferred future, instances. And we can get to the instances through the scale if we want to do that. So moving away from an exception-based model towards a preferred future-based model, we're centralizing the client and the client's own words rather than building the whole session towards a task or homework that comes, it did build on the client's thinking, but nonetheless, the client's experience of that was that they were being told what to do. So it centralized the position of the worker. We were moving away from a more interventive model and all we're doing now is just description, just inviting people to describe the life that they want. And I think in some senses, we've also been doing something that was present in Steve DeShazer's thinking, but we've been humanizing. We're moving into a world of possibility rather than a contractual, predictable, machine-like world. We've moved away from anything, and this wasn't present in Steve DeShazer's thinking, I'm not implying that, but we've moved away from action planning, the idea 
that people are logical, that somehow they can decide what to do and then they go away and do it. Who knows what people are going to do after a session? We just can't know. And so rather than action planning, we've moved into a frame of in the moment planning. We invite people to go away and in essence, notice what they're doing that's useful, in essence. And um, when we do that, they discover in the moment what works for them. And so we've moved into the maybe, perhaps world, rather than the world where people are predictable when they decide what to do, and then they go away and do it. And above all, we've moved into a world where we trust and believe in our clients. We're not thinking through what the client is saying for what's really going on. That's gone. That had already gone into Shazer's world, but that's gone. We work with the client's narrative and we look for the evidence that tells us you can do this. So trusting and believing in our clients has become more and more central in the work that we do. In this paper, again, from 1998, something that Steve wrote with Gail Miller, Emotions in Solution-Focused Therapy, Re-Examination. A phrase that jumps out for me is that what we're doing in Solution Focus is building homes for solutions. Building homes for solutions is what the Solution Focus language game is designed to do. There is Steve drawing on Wittgenstein's thinking about language games. So building homes for solutions. Now, again, the word homes doesn't quite work for me. I guess the way that I would think about it is that what we're doing is inviting people to describe the life that fits with the best hopes. That would be a slightly different version of this. Building the life or describing the life that fits with the best hopes. That I think is what we're doing in the Solution Focus. And look, we could go all the way back a hundred years earlier to Claude Monet, the French Impressionist. And I love this. Other painters paint a bridge, a house, a boat. I want to paint the air that surrounds the bridge, the house, the boat, the beauty of the life in which they exist. And I think that's what we're describing. That's what we're inviting people to describe. The beauty of the life in which the best hopes exist. Lots of, lots of approaches to solving problems, they stay so close to the problem. You know, they really are painting the bridge, the house, the boat. Whereas we're inviting people to describe and to construct the life within which the best hopes naturally find their place. It's hard to do. The problem, the bridge, the house, the boat, draw us to them with magnetic power. And we're doing something different. Solution focus isn't easy to do. It really isn't. In many ways it is, it doesn't fit with our instincts. It doesn't fit with what we might naturally do with people. People come to us with a problem and it's so obvious that we should be focusing on the problem, staying close to the problem. And solution focus steps away, steps into the life. And in order to be able to do that, we really, really, really 
have to trust in and believe in our client. Solution focus it might be simple, but it's really not easy. <laughs>